by Foundations of Writing on the Academic Agency. To write clearly will help you to think clearly. The ability to communicate ideas in lucid prose is foundational to success in many areas, and it is a basic requirement in every walk of life. You will learn the parts of speech and come to understand the core functions of the English language, sentence construction and syntax, punctuation, style, and common mistakes. Once you see how mistakes are made, you will not unsee them. You will know for the rest of your life. Foundations of Writing. Buy it now. Recently, I had a bit of a debate about intellectual property rights, specifically copyright and trademarks, with several libertarian friends of mine on EconChat. I've linked it in the show notes. I was on the side of IP. Radlib, Lambda and Mad Merck were on the anti-IP side. I consider their position to be nonsensical and vice versa. They were drawing on the libertarian legal theorist Stephen Kinsella, who is a member of the Mises Institute and who wrote what is considered the definitive argument on this topic. It is called Against Intellectual Property. In this video, I want to do two things. First, I want to lay out my own positive vision of intellectual property. That is, I want to explain why I support IP on both moral and utilitarian grounds. Second, I want to pinpoint where I think Kinsella goes wrong. So let me begin. We are the music makers and we are the dreamers of dreams. These lines begin the poem Ode by Arthur O'Shaughnessy. They are repeated by Willy Wonka as played by Gene Wilder in the 1971 film. And it is in fact with Wonka that I'd like to start my defence of IP. In that same film, Wonka sings, Come with me and you'll be in a world of pure imagination. Take a look and you'll see into your imagination. But access to this world is closed off. Of course, famously, Wonka issues five golden tickets and the lucky winners gain access to his dream world. A dream world which has been made manifest in a physical factory, but which originated in the head of Mr. Willy Wonka. In the film, these tickets are so scarce and so highly prized that everybody from the Queen of England to South American dictators do whatever they can to get some Wonka bars in order to try to win a golden ticket. Why do I mention this? I mention it because intellectual property is much like gaining access to Wonka's factory. When you buy a book, for example, you are not buying paper and ink. You are buying, in effect, a dream ticket. You are buying access to the world of pure imagination dreamed up by the author. And just as the kids in Wonka, you get to play there for a while. The book is a physical portal into the dream world. It is obvious that when people buy, for example, a copy of George R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire, they are buying this experience, access to the fantasy world, rather than mere paper and ink. This is why people will also buy it in audio form or in digital form. The material form of the text is less important than the ideas that the text conveys. The text is just a portal. So intellectual property is justified on these grounds. You are buying access as manifest in a physical object to ideas and experiences, much like a ticket to a theme park. I suppose it's no coincidence that Walt Disney invented Disneyland. His business was selling dreams. And Mickey Mouse, one of the most famous IP properties in the world, is estimated to generate about $5 billion a year. What is the moral basis for an author laying claim to owning their ideas? We can justify it in the same way that land ownership rights are justified through the Lockean homesteading principle. If you consider that in the landscape of ideas, or if you prefer the world of pure imagination, or if you prefer Plato's world of forms, 
ideas are nearly infinite in their potential and variety, then it only seems fair that the person who gets to a specific configuration of said ideas to have homesteaded that configuration on the finder's keeper's principle. Walt Disney was the only person to invent Mickey Mouse, a character with unique and distinctive features. Let us not pretend that he is not unique and distinctive. We know he has the big ears, the white gloves, the red shorts, the yellow shoes, his very specific face, and so on and so forth. Disney was the only person in the world to put together these specific elements in this specific form. And therefore, it is correct that he owns the rights to this character. And subsequently, that he is able to transfer or sell those rights to third parties, much as the original owner of some land may sell the deeds to a third party. That is how property rights work. Those who argue against IP claim that copying an idea is not the same as stealing it because if someone uses their own printing press to copy, say, a print of Mickey Mouse or a copy of Martin's Song of Ice and Fire, then the claim to IP is violating the owner of that printing press's property rights because it is dictating what they can do with it. In this case, the anti-IP advocates claim that the owner of the printing press should be allowed to do with their press as they please and indeed to sell the products of that press, even if those products are not ones they came up with themselves. But this is willfully to misunderstand what is being sold. As I said, it's not paper and ink that is being sold, but tickets to a dream world. What right does some third party have to sell such tickets to dream worlds that they did not create? None at all. And this is readily understood by all right-thinking people. In the absence of a state, the original creator would have to take up arms or to employ security firms to enforce their IP claim. But this, again, is no different to a property claim on land, which is enforced on pain of violence. Again, in the free market, uh, in the absence of a state, Walt Disney would have to employ security firms to defend his land, and in the same way, he would employ a security firm to defend his IP claim on Mickey Mouse. In our society, property rights are upheld by the state, and so IP rights are upheld by the state. But the principle is identical. To try to distinguish between land and IP on the basis that one is physical and the other is only in the realm of ideas seems to me to be literalist in the most dunderheaded sense. In fact, that it is chiefly an idea, which is to say a non-material thing, that is at stake in questions of subjective value is intrinsic to economic theory going right back to Karl Menger. Recall Menga said, no one values wheat as wheat per se, but for the individual functions that wheat satisfies. So really, the person doesn't want the wheat, but the idea of something to satisfy his food need, something to satisfy his hygiene need, something to satisfy his need to feed his cows, something to satisfy his need to make alcoholic drinks, and so on and so forth. Thus, wheat can be substituted with any number of other goods that fulfill the same function for a minimal trade-off of want satisfaction. The actual physical good is subordinate in each case to the psychic need being addressed. The satisfaction that is satisfied. This is the thing that is valued, not the object itself. The actual physical good is subordinate in each case to the psychic need. In a sense, then, all goods satisfy wants that cannot be seen or easily measured. Yet, we take it for granted that there exists a market for wheat and that a man can own wheat as property. What difference, then, between wheat and the virtual good, which in our case are the tickets to a dream world created by some author? 
just as the physical wheat is only a physical token of that mental need that the consumer wishes to satisfy, so too is the book only a physical token representing that mental need of accessing the dream world through which the words might transport you. This is to say nothing of other intangible goods on the market like swaps, futures, you know, complex financial goods. All of these are accepted by libertarians, even though they don't really have anything kind of physical or tangible attached to them, but yet we we recognize that they exist as assets. So I, I don't see this hang up on the word uh, physical being valid at all, really. And this brings me, finally, to the utilitarian grounds for supporting intellectual property. Why are property rights good at all, aside from the moral question of Lockean homesteading? They are good because they ensure that land is subjected to a self-interested monitor. Someone who owns their own home is more likely to look after it than somebody who only rents, and even more so than somebody who is simply given that home by the government. When land is held in common, it is said to lead to the tragedy of the commons. The monopoly ownership of intellectual property by the original author or whoever they sell those deeds to function in the same way. You have a self-interested monitor looking over how the IP is treated. Walt Disney would never allow Mickey Mouse to appear in ways that were fundamentally untrue to his creation. Whereas, if Mickey Mouse was subject to common ownership, in which any old Tom, Dick and Harry could make Mickey Mouse cartoons and products, we'd see poor Mickey abused and debased. Another context in which the tragedy of the commons is usually evoked by libertarians is in environmental matters. It is said that a private forest owner seldom has the problem of overforestation because he has a vested interest in maintaining the value and productivity of his forest. When woodlands and jungles are held in common ownership, however, they are subject to overforestation, which is to say too many people are chopping down trees in the absence of a monopoly right over those trees. This is also true of IP. We do not need to create hypothetical scenarios in which hundreds of people are creating second-rate Star Wars films or Mickey Mouse cartoons or Batman comics or anything else, because there are living examples of the tragedy of the commons due to lapsed copyright or public domain all over Amazon. Let me use an example of one of my most beloved authors, Thomas Carlyle. Carlyle died in 1866, and his books are long out of copyright. Even with the 70-year rule, Carlyle's books would have been public domain by 1936 at the latest. The last official edition of his works was the Chapman and Hall Centennial Edition, originally published in 1895 to mark 100 years since Carlyle's death, and the final reprint was in 1907. Even today, this 30-volume complete works of Carlyle, edited by Henry Duff Trial, is the definitive edition and it is printed by Cambridge University Press. Other scholarly presses also produce high quality editions of his individual works. For example, Yale brought out this excellent edition of On Heroes and Hero Worship. However, because there is no self-interested monitor watching over the Carlyle estate, unless you are a trained scholar like me, you'd not know that these ex editions exist at all. If you search Amazon for books by Thomas Carlyle, you are confronted by the IP equivalent of the tragedy of the commons. What you'll find is pages upon pages of low quality reprints by two bit pikey presses with random front covers, no scholarly notes, no indexes, no editors. These parasitic presses are not so much helping to keep Carlyle's memory alive as they are doing intellectual violence to him by offering the equivalent of discount scalper tickets to jump over the fence to gain access to Carlyle's dream world. The fundamental problem is one of oversupply. There are simply too many presses bringing out low-quality editions of Carlyle and there is no self-interested monitor to enforce quality control.
Contrast that with an author who is in copyright, such as George R. R. Martin, and you quickly find that no such problems exist, since he has granted Harper Voyager monopoly rights to print his work. There is no question as to which are the definitive editions, since you are not confronted with endless pages of second-rate versions. This is the world of IP, while this, the tragedy of commons you see on Carlyle's page, is the world that the anti-IPers want. Are you sick of hearing about Marx and Keynes? Do you want to know why neoclassical economics is so flawed? Have you ever wondered how to work out the marginal productivity of a burger bun? Do you want to level up your econ knowledge? Buy it now. £350. Foundations of Economics. Foundations of Economics. I'm here. Foundations of Economics. Get it now. So let us turn now to Stephen Kinsella's Against Intellectual Property and see how he justifies wanting this awful state of affairs. He suggests that the principle of scarcity is at the root of the need for property rights and pulls on this quotation from Hans Hermann Hopper's Theory of Socialism and Capitalism to make the point. This is Hopper. Only because scarcity exists is there even a problem of formulating moral laws. Insofar as goods are superabundant, free goods, no conflict over the use of goods is possible and no action coordination is needed. Hence, it follows that any ethic, correctly conceived, must be formulated as a theory of property, that is, a theory of the assignment of rights of exclusive control over scarce means, because only then does it become possible to avoid otherwise inescapable and unresolvable conflict. Kinsella then evokes Locke's homesteading principle to justify property rights when it comes to land and physical goods before turning to say this principle cannot apply to ideas as IP rights tr try to do. He argues, and this is Kinsella, the problem with IP rights is that the ideal objects protected by IP rights are not scarce, and further, that such property rights are not and cannot be allocated in accordance with the first occupier homesteading rule, as will be seen below. But already this is nonsense, because Kinsella, whether deliberately or not, misses a crucial point made by both Locke and Hopper. That is, in the absence of property rights, the goods of the world have the appearance of abundance. This is what leads to the tragedy of the commons in the first place. When the hunter-gatherer picks a berry from a bush or kills a deer in the woods, he or she does not replace either good, but rather wanders on to the next bush or woods in search of yet more berries and deer. Some hunter-gatherers are kept from over-hunting and over-gathering by the inefficiency of their methods, which limits them to near subsistence levels and therefore to small populations. But this is not sustainability because they are still taking non-renewable resources without replacing them. There is evidence that early hunter-gatherers from around 13,400 years ago hunted over 30 mammal species, including mammoths, mastodons and giant armadillos to extinction. Now, I have already shown you an example of how an author like Thomas Carlyle is being overhunted in real life in a case of the tragedy of the commons on Amazon. These low quality editions risk devaluing the Carlyle canon to such an extent that finding authentic texts of his presented in a format worthy of the golden ticket becomes impossible and he will, in effect, go extinct. I believe this would happen very quickly should massive IP estates such as Harry Potter, Star Wars or Game of Thrones fall into the public domain. They would, in effect, be hunted to extinction in exactly this way through chronic oversupply of content. Kinsella argues that where the dream world are concerned, there is no genuine scarcity, only artificial scarcity, but also that is not true. The supply of Song of Ice and Fire stories is limited to the mind of George R. R. Martin, and the supply of golden tickets to his dream world is limited by the monopoly right he has granted to his publisher. Eradicate that monopoly right, and we will see a glut of editions of increasingly low quality, such that access to Martin's dream world will be utterly devalued. 
eradicate Martin's sole right to supply Song of Ice and Fire stories, and the market will suffer from an avalanche of awful fanfic effectively destroying his dream world. If you thought season 8 of Game of Thrones, the TV show, was bad, you haven't seen anything yet. This franchise and all others would be destroyed extremely quickly, reduced to the level of unauthorised, non-canon Star Wars novels rightly forgotten to the dustbin of history. And again, if you thought The Last Jedi was bad, you ain't seen nothing yet. Why is it that anti-IP advocates simply forget that the tragedy of commons is a thing when they discuss property rights uh, and IP? Kinsella goes on to argue that ideas can be homesteaded like land can because they are not physical and therefore cannot be owned. The problem with natural rights defence of IP, he says, then lies in the argument that because an author-inventor creates something, he is thus entitled to own it. The argument begs the question by assuming that the ideal object is ownable in the first place. Once this is granted, it seems natural that the creator of this piece of property is the natural and proper owner of it. However, ideal objects are not ownable, he simply states. He justifies this by redefining locks mixing the land with labour by the concept of occupancy. So in Kinsella's conception, it's not mixing the land with labour, it's occupying the land, possessing it, as he puts it. In this way, he denies the pro-IP argument put forward by Ran Anne Rand about authors being the natural owners of their work as a reward for productive work. He then states, and again I quote, Thus, because ideas are not scarce resources in the sense that physical conflict over their use is possible, they are not the proper subject of property rights designed to avoid such conflicts. But the preceding argument, the argument that Kinsella lays forth, simply does not show this. In what sense does redefining locks mixing labour with the land to occupying the land demonstrate that physical conflict over ownership of an idea is not possible? As I said earlier, it is easy to imagine a situation on the free market whereby Walt Disney would hire a security company to protect the distribution and sale of Mickey Mouse products. Why wouldn't there be physical conflict over a $5 billion a year asset? Furthermore, it is clear that time has a value to people, that we in some sense own our own time, and that taking one course of action imposes an opportunity cost on all other courses of action. If time were not our own, the Austrian justification for wage labour would sink. So we must de facto own our own time, even though it has no physical properties or characteristics and cannot be seen. So I don't know how Kinsella deals with time, because he doesn't really mention it. On these points, Kinsella only points back to Hopper. He says, quote, As Hopper has trenchantly shown, one cannot have a property right in the value of one's property, but only in its physical integrity. Okay, so let's go back to the source and see what Hopper said. First, does he even say this? If you go to pages 139 to 141 of his book, Hopper is actually talking about how human values manifest in action. He says... One only experiences things because they are things on which positive or negative value can be placed in the course of action. Only by an actor, that is to say, can things be experienced as value laden. And even more generally, only because one is an actor does one have conscious experiences at all, as they inform about things which might be valuable for an acting person to know. More precisely, with every action, an actor pursues a goal. He wants to produce a definite result or be prepared for a result that he cannot prevent from happening. Whatever the goal of his action, which of course one could only know from experience, the fact that it is pursued by an actor reveals that he places value on it, so to speak. Are you seeing this extreme emphasis on the physical that Kinsella implies? Because I'm not. In fact, Hopper goes on to discuss the fact that taking actions in time always imposes opportunity costs, as I just did. I mean, I hate to say this, but these three pages of Hopper simply do not say 
what Kinsella says they do. For one thing, they aren't even about property rights. Hopper is discussing the praxeological justification for Misesian a prioriism, as you can see. For another, Hoppy Hopper only discusses action, time and value in this passage. He does not mention physical, tangible goods or the concept of property rights. So I am not quite sure how or why Kinsella thinks this passage supports his point or indeed how he thinks this is uh, Hopper's trenchantly showing one cannot have a property right in the value of one's property but only in its physical integrity since he doesn't even mention these things. Now in fairness Kinsella provides another paid reference page 247 footnote 17. Let's take a look at that to ensure that we haven't missed something. I want to do my homework here in the um, spirit of intellectual charity and rigor and thoroughness. Well Houston we have a problem because here is page 247 of Hopper's theory of socialism capitalism. Uh, it doesn't have a footnote 17. Now I checked my personal paperback copy and well in that page 247 is part of the index. So I figured something was up here because the quotation that he, the reference he gave to the previous pages didn't line up with what he said it was and now I've come across this footnote that doesn't exist. What's going on? So when, anyway I checked the bibliography to see the specific edition Kinsella was using and apparently he was using the original 1989 version and it turns out that my printed copy is a second edition from 2013 and the one on the Mises site is a slightly older edition from 2010 which is different from my one but also different from the one Kinsella was using. Anyway, after much searching around, uh, I have located the original 1989 version here on Google Books. And sure enough, page 247 should contain a note. So let's have a look. Here we go. Oh, it's just a reference to Mises. And note 17 isn't even on page 247. It's on page 246. Okay, I think that'll do when it comes to locating this footnote. I've given Kinsella every chance. I consulted three different versions of the book. I can only assume that the reference is wrong or that he made a mistake. However, in the interest of absolute fairness, I want to double check pages 139 to 141 in this edition to see if Hopper is saying anything different there than when I checked earlier because it didn't add up. So let's take a look. Okay. This does look like a different passage, and I can see right away the word physical is right there in italics. So let's take a look. This seems more like it. Um, and I've left all of this stuff in so you, to show you that I am doing this properly. I'm not kind of cutting corners. I'm showing my work, okay? Anyway, Hopper. The first such specification is that according to the capital... Uh, the capitalistic ethic, aggression is defined as an invasion of the physical integrity of another person's property. So, socialism, instead, would define aggression as an invasion of the value or psychic integrity of another person's property. Okay, so this seems, finally, we've got to uh, the heart of Kinsella's reference. Um, it just took me quite a long time to find it. So let us quote Hopper at length here, because this, I think, is the crux and the meat of the entire argument. Hopper. Why is this idea of protecting the value of property unjustifiable? First, while every person, at least in principle, can have full control over whether or not his actions cause the physical characteristics of something to change, and hence also have full control over whether or not those actions are justifiable, control over whether or not one's actions affect the value of someone else's property does not rest with the acting person, but rather with other people and their subjective evaluations. Thus, no one could determine ex ante if his actions would be classified as justifiable or unjustifiable. One would first have to interrogate the whole population to make sure that one's planned actions would not change another person's evaluations regarding his own property. And even then, nobody could act until universal agreement was reached on who is supposed to do what with what 
and at which point in time. Clearly, for all the practical problems involved, one would be long dead and nobody would argue anything any longer before this was ever accomplished. But more decisively still, the socialist position regarding property and aggression could not even be effectively argued, because arguing in favour of any norm, socialist or not, implies that there is conflict over the use of some scarce resource, otherwise there would simply be no need for discussion. However, in order to argue that there is a way out of such conflict, it must be presupposed that actions must be allowed to be performed prior to any actual agreement or disagreement, because if they were not, one could not even argue so. Yet, if one can do this, and socialism too must assume that one can, insofar as it exists as an argued intellectual position, then this is only possible because the existence of objective borders of property, that is, borders which every person can recognise as such on his own, without having to agree first with anyone else with respect to one's system of values and evaluations. Socialism too, then, in spite of what it says, must in fact presuppose the existence of objective property boundaries rather than of borders determined by subjective evaluations, if only in order to have any surviving socialist who can make his moral proposals. OK, well, let's pause here before continuing, because there's a lot to take in. First, I should point out that Hopper here is not talking about intellectual property at all. He is talking about the Marxist claim that workers should have a claim to own the factories at which they work because of quote-unquote surplus value. Second, I am failing to see how Walt Disney's ownership of Mickey Mouse or George R. R. Martin's ownership of the Song of Ice and Fire and the sale of golden tickets to gain access to those dream worlds fails Hopper's test. He said, quote, borders which every person can recognise as such on his own. Well, who imagines that Mickey Mouse is their creation? Who imagines that they have the right to make and sell Mickey Mouse cartoons without Walt Disney's permission? Who imagines that they might be able to write new novels in the Song of Ice and Fire series and then sell them in competition with George R. R. Martin without his permission? And who imagines that in a total free market society in the imagined Ankapistan that you do any of these things without reprisal from Disney or from Martin or from Martin's publishers. They would move ruthlessly to protect their assets using private security to do so if necessary. And no private judge on the free market system would deny that Mickey Mouse does in fact belong to Walt Disney, that the Song of Ice and Fire does in fact belong to George R. R. Martin and so on and so forth. Anyone who is in touch with Hans Hermann Hopper should write to him and ask him, free of any context, does Walt Disney own Mickey Mouse? Does George R. R. Martin own the Song of Ice and Fire? In fact, go one further. Ask him if Hans Hermann Hopper owns Democracy the God that Failed. Or let us use Reductio Ad Absurdum to make the point instead. Does Russell Grant, the fat astrologer, own Democracy the God that Failed? Does Jeffrey Tucker, the gay libertarian, own Mickey Mouse? These questions are obvious absurdities because we know that Grant or Tucker have absolutely no claim whatsoever to the intellectual properties of either Mickey Mouse or uh, Democracy the God that Failed. And neither do you. Everybody automatically recognises the right of the creator to ownership. Anyway, Hopper continues. The socialist idea of protecting value instead of physical integrity also fails for a second related reason. Evidently, the value of a person, for example, on the labour or the marriage market can be and indeed is affected by other people's physical integrity or degree of physical integrity. Thus, if one wanted property values to be protected, one would have to allow physical aggression against people. However, it is only because of the very fact that a person's borders, that is the borders of a person's property in his body as his domain of exclusive control with which another person is not allowed to interfere unless he wishes to become an aggressor, are physical borders intersubjectively ascertainable and not just subjectively fancy borders that everyone can agree on anything independently. And of course, agreement means agreement of independent decision-making units. 
only because the protected borders of property are objective then, that is fixed and recognisable as fixed prior to any conventional agreement, can there be at all an argumentation and possibly agreement between independent decision-making units. There simply could not be anyone arguing anything unless his existence as an independent physical unit was first recognised. No one could argue in favour of a property system defining borders of property in subjective evaluative terms, as does socialism, because simply to be able to say so presupposes that, contrary to what the theory says, one must, in fact, be a physically independent unit saying it. This is, of course, Hopper's argumentation ethics, famously. But OK, let's follow the logic in the case of IP. Imagine a world where Walt Disney had never existed. Could the argument over who owns Mickey Mouse even exist? Well, no, because presumably nobody else would have created Mickey Mouse in the first place. Let's try the same with George R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire. Again, you see the absurdity of even trying to do so, since the creator of the dream world comes prior, is in fact the precondition of the dream world itself. And this is automatically, as Hopper says, fixed and recognisable as fixed prior to any conventional agreement. How could it not be? And that, my friends, is where I turn it over to you. Except for this one last point, a long-time buddy of mine, Jay Greenriver, has asked me about the case of second-hand books. He says, if it is the ideas being sold and not the pen and ink, how can I justify the sale of second-hand books being legal? The answer to this is simple. If you accept my analogy of a book being like a golden ticket to a dream world, you are simply selling on that ticket there is no crime here since originally the author got paid and you are simply selling on your access to the dream world to somebody else. I hope that clears up that little point and again I will turn it over to you interested to hear all of your thoughts. Now available at the Academic Agency. Sharpen your analytical mind and your argumentation skills with Foundations of Logic. The course draws on the ancient wisdom of traditional logic that students learned for over 2,000 years from the time of Aristotle through to the medieval schoolmen right down to the 20th century. Sign up now for a free preview lecture. Be sure to like this video and subscribe. And if you really like my content, maybe consider joining the channel or donating or maybe even buy a mug. I am grateful for all of your support. Now get out.